Saturday, two kings collide. I don't think this has ever been done in the history of the game. The king of the ring, Floyd Money Mayweather. I've changed not just the sport of boxing, but sports, period. The king of the octagon, the notorious Conor McGregor. One shot is all it takes me. Face off in one of the most anticipated fights in history, and only one will reign. I've been on the top of the throne for years. And look at that Mayweather vs. McGregor, Saturday, 9 Eastern, 6 Pacific, live on pay-per-view. This this is the Stephen A. Smith Show Podcast. I'm Stephen A. The champ is here. It's Chris Canny, Super Bowl champion, filling in on the Stephen A. Smith Show. The number is 866-729-3776. That's 866-SAY-ESPN. And, of course, we got a lot to get to today, but we're going to start with, of course, the main event. It's going down out in Las Vegas at the T-Mobile Arena. It's Conor McGregor. It's Floyd Mayweather. It's the fight that everybody's been talking about. It's everything that everybody wants to see. It's the spectacle. Does Conor McGregor even have a shot at being able to compete? Does he even belong in the same ring as Floyd Mayweather when it comes to a boxing bout? Everyone, he wants to give Conor McGregor a puncher's chance. But I'm here to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, I don't think Conor McGregor has a shot at being able to upset Floyd Mayweather. Floyd is just too skilled, and everybody wants to point to the fact that he's just a defensive fighter. But the precision from Floyd Mayweather's punches, the fact that he's one of the best counterpunchers in the history of the sport, I think Conor McGregor is in for a world of hurt. But, of course, we're going to open up the phone lines to hear what you have to say about it. And listening this morning to ESPN MMA boxing MMA analyst Brett Okamoto, he talked about Conor McGregor, and he said that Conor McGregor fully intends to continue to fight after this bout in the UFC. And he said that Conor McGregor, his intention is to leverage this purse that he's going to get with the Floyd Mayweather fight into a position where potentially having an ownership stake in UFC as he moves forward with that career. But when I thought more and more about it, I said, does this mean that Conor McGregor going into Saturday night's fight knows that he's going to be able to lose this fight? Does he believe that he has an opportunity that he's going to win? I don't know, ladies and gentlemen. I I Honestly, I just don't know. When it comes down to it, I think Conor McGregor looked at this as an opportunity to get the financial security that he wanted in his career, and he wasn't going to achieve that in the UFC. He wasn't going to achieve that in one of those bouts that was organized by Dana White. This represented an opportunity for him to capitalize on a payday, of course, going up against, pound for pound, arguably the best fighter of all time and Floyd Mayweather. And Mayweather is looking at it the same way. Everybody wants to talk about Floyd Mayweather potentially losing the O, this being his 50th bout. Listen, Floyd Mayweather is not stepping into a ring to jeopardize his legacy against Conor McGregor. Floyd Mayweather understands that he is going to win this fight. He's operating from a position of strength being that this is a boxing bout. This is a sanctioned bout by the Nevada Boxing Commission. That's what's happening. Floyd Mayweather is not concerned about Conor McGregor potentially upsetting him. Now, that doesn't mean that Floyd Mayweather is not taking this fight seriously. And I know that Floyd Mayweather is making up all these excuses and the potential opportunity for Conor to win. Oh, Conor's the bigger fighter. Conor's got the the advantage in terms of his reach. Uh, All of those things sound great. But that's Floyd Mayweather, the businessman, trying to sell the public on reasons why they should buy the fight, trying to sell the public on the potential of him losing, trying to sell the public on the potential for an upset. But ladies and gentlemen, I'm here to tell you, that's not going to happen on Saturday night. I think you're going to be entertained if you're prepared to see a spectacle. I think Conor McGregor will be the aggressor in this fight. But I also think that Floyd Mayweather, as he always does, is going to crack the code in terms of how Conor McGregor is going to attack him. Floyd Mayweather has been in the ring with Hall of Fame boxers, and they couldn't knock him out. So what makes you think that Conor McGregor, somebody with a limited boxing background, is going to be able to beat Floyd Mayweather, one of the best boxers of all time? I just don't see it happening. But now we're going to go to the phone lines. I think we got Jack in New Jersey. He wants to comment on the Mayweather-McGregor fight. Jack, what you got for me? Hey, how you doing, man? Big fan. Look, I'm not going to buy the fight, but I'll watch it like a day after or whatever. But I just believe that Conor McGregor has as much chance of beating Floyd Mayweather as Tim Tebow 
has as much as hitting a home run off Clayton Kershaw. He has experience, <laughs> but come on. That's all I got to say, man. I appreciate what you do, and I'm a big fan. No, nah, Jack, you're absolutely right, and I appreciate the love, appreciate the phone call. You know, you're absolutely right. I, I mean, you know, when you start comparing Floyd Mayweather being in the boxing ring with Conor McGregor, I mean, it's 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 clearly somebody that's going to outclass Conor McGregor. I mean, he has no business in terms of being able, from a skill set perspective, approach this fight with the mentality that he's going to win. Now, of course, it's a combat sport, and so you would expect that Conor McGregor coming into the ring is going to try to do everything within his power to give himself the best chance that he can to be successful. But ultimately, he's got to know in the back of his mind that he's got no shot. Raphael in Long Island City. Raphael, you're on the Stephen A. Smith Show live with Chris Canny. What's up, Chris? How are you, man? <laughs> I'm all right. How you doing? I'm okay. It's just that this is so funny because these are the two of the best. I'm looking at them as two of the best promoting fighters in the nation. We're talking about MMA as well as UFC and as well as Floyd Mayweather, who's a talented, excellent boxer. Okay. But it's like... It's being sold where we're going to be able to see an entertaining fight. The question is, can McGregor beat him, who has come a little bit of skills of boxing, but he's a mixed martial artist, as well as Mayweather as an excellent defensive, as well as a skilled uh, uh, boxer as well. If you ask me, honestly, uh, it can go, maybe it can go both ways. I believe Floyd has the edge. He'll dodge. He'll, he'll box. I'll box him like he's, he's done in the past. But it, I don't know. Honestly, it's got me having edge as well if he c- click and actually make some contact. Question is, can Floyd uh, stay there and uh, go toe-to-toe with him and, and try to outbox him or maybe knock him out? Everybody's talking about not going past the fourth round. I don't know. Too many rumors. Well, Raphael, Ra- Ra- Raphael, and I get your point. I think duration will play a part in this fight because let's keep in mind, the bouts that Conor McGregor has in the UFC, I don't think they go longer than five rounds. So, I mean, he's not accustomed to the duration of what will be this boxing match's 12-round bout with Floyd Mayweather. So I think that can play a role in terms of being able to maintain your focus and your conditioning. And, of course, Floyd Mayweather, I don't think he's he's going to stand toe-to-toe with Conor McGregor. That's not his fighting style. He's going to use the entire ring. He's not going to allow Conor McGregor to box him into a corner. But, again, I think Conor will have opportunities. And so I think it'll be interesting to see how this fight plays out in terms of the style because we all have to assume that Conor McGregor is going to be a little bit unorthodox in in his approach and his attack to on Floyd Mayweather. But, again, I think Floyd, after a couple of rounds, is going to figure out what's going on with Conor McGregor, and he's going to be able to attack him. He's going to be effective with the precision of his punches and, of course, being one of the best counterpunchers in the business. If I can add, it's like I'm old school boxing uh, fan. Uh, the times of Marvin Hagler, Tommy Hearns, Sugar Ray. You remember when, if you recall, uh, when Sugar Ray had to fight all the fighters, be it Marvin Hagler, be it Duran, be it uh, uh, Tommy Hearns. He always, Sugar Ray used to always study them. Everybody was like, you yeah, one round where he would study him and look at him and see if there was any weakness what the other opponent would actually show. And in reality, that's what Floyd has. Floyd has that talent where he'll study him a little bit, feel him out, and then he will actually take him out. No, Raphael, I get your point. I appreciate the phone call. We've got to run. I've actually got my co-host, Dave Rothenberg, coming in the studio with me. So we'll continue to get into the Conor McGregor-Floyd Mayweather fight. We'll get his thoughts on it, but we're going to get a couple of more phone calls before we go to break. We've got Kevin in New Jersey. Kevin, you're on the Stephen A. Smith Show live with Chris Canny. Hey, Chris, good to hear from you. Listen, to the last caller, obviously you know nothing about boxing. And if anybody... <laughs> Tell them how you really feel, Raphael. Tell them how you really feel. ...thinks that Conor has a chance of even landing a punch... You should. You know nothing about boxing. Cut their mic off. Hang up on them. <laughs> it's ridiculous. Well, it's you know. Ridiculous. Well, you know what, Kevin? Kevin, I was actually talking with my uh, co-host on the Humpty and Candy show, Rick DiPietro, and he said that a lot of people are trying to justify reasons why they should buy the fight. They're trying to give themselves that belief that Conor McGregor, there's a chance 
that he can catch Floyd Mayweather. There's a chance that he could potentially upset him. But ultimately, I think we all know what's going to take place on Saturday night. Will it be entertaining? I think it'll be highly entertaining. I can't wait to see it. But I think we all know what the outcome is going to be. Whether it's by decision or by knockout, Floyd Mayweather will win this fight on Saturday night. For, as a, I've been watching boxing for a long time. I just think it's an embarrassment for boxing to even allow this fight to go on. You know, those guys promoted the hell out of this fight. They they, they pimped everybody to, to, uh, to co buy it so they can make millions of dollars, knowing that Floyd is the best who's ever done it. And- oh, Kevin, I think I lost you, buddy. But listen, it's time for us to go to break. This is the Stephen A. Smith Show with Chris Canny, with Dave Rothenberg. We'll get to more of your calls next. Want to be a part of the show? It's Stephen A. Up weekdays from 1 to 3 Eastern at 866-729-3776. Daddy, where do babies come from? Uh, well, uh... Honey? Mommy went to the store. Oh, well, you see, um, well, there's a mommy and a daddy, right? Right. And see, when they call GEICO, uh, they could save a bunch of money on car insurance. Oh, really? And that makes them happy? Yes, that makes them very happy. That's good. Yeah. Well, I'm glad we could have this talk, sunshine. (laughs) GEICO, because saving 15% or more on car insurance is always a great answer. You're listening to the Stephen A. Smith Show podcast. Dave Rothenberg. Chris Canny in for Stephen A, ESPN Radio, ESPN app. I, I got to tell you something, Canny. What's up? And it, it pains me a slight bit to say this. So I apologize for being a couple of moments late to the show, but I was hoping that as I was walking in, I'd hear you fall on your face. And I'd be like, <laughs> oh, you know, I let me let me run in because this is a guy clearly incapable of hosting a show by himself for any length of time. And when I heard you, I was like, he doesn't even need me. Like you, you don't need me. I don't know why you would undersell the fact that I would be able to carry the show until you got here. Because you're a football player. Well, Dave, I'm a Super Bowl champ. Yeah, it's true. So anytime I put my mind to something, I guess I'm I guess done. with that ring, everything is uh, very very relevant. You're capable of doing anything. Anyhow, um, it's very almost proud like of staying you. at a Holiday Inn. <laughs> yes, yes, you can have perform <laughs> surgery on the leg uh, the next morning. Eight six six A E S B N eight six six seven two nine three seven seven six. We got a lot to do. We're going to run through this. Um, this quarterback tiers list from Mike Sando, which I think is very, very interesting. Uh, obviously, the fight is certainly topic number one. Uh, the Jets, the Giants, NFL, lots to do. Andrew Luck. Andrew Luck may not be back for week one, something we certainly want to get into as well. Stephen A is going to join us a little bit later on during the course of the show. I heard you talking about this fight, and I agree with you. This is a fight which, they, I'm sorry, Chris, there's no way that Conor McGregor is winning this fight, and everybody... And this is what happens with a big event, I think. You always try to convince yourself, well, you know, the more time, the more you think about it, the more people you talk to, well, maybe there's a chance, you know, he could catch him. It's not, it's not going to happen. This, it's not going to happen. Uh, Mayweather's going to win this fight. No, he's clearly going to win this fight. He's the most experienced boxer. He's one of the best boxers of all time. And I can't rationalize Conor McGregor being able to do something that Hall of Fame boxers have not been able, been able to do in 49 bouts. Floyd hasn't had an off night. Nobody's been able to beat him. Nobody's been able to catch him. He hasn't been knocked out. So I don't see that happening against Conor McGregor. Now, I understand that McGregor is going to have an unorthodox attack coming from an MMA background. But, I mean, he's got a limited skill set when it comes to being able to be a boxer going up against one of the best boxers in the history of the sport. I just don't see Floyd getting upset on Saturday night. No, he's not going to. And if you're, you know, there's a lot of people betting huge amounts of money to win a, a, a quarter of that money back in return. Like you bet 100 yeah. grand, you get 25 grand back. That to me is the short bet. Everyone's excited. Oh, I'm going to bet $500 and try to win 2,500. But you're donating $500. That's is what exactly you're doing. what you're doing. It's not, it's not going to happen. <laughs> and I heard you discussing something earlier, which I, I was in intrigued by and that is is there anything Mayweather has to do like if Mayweather goes out and toys with him the way he did Pacquiao and it's an easy fight but it's bland and it's boring even though he wins does he lose in this fight no I don't think he loses in this fight even if it's not as entertaining as people might think it should be Uh, but I think it's going to be hard for it not to be because Connor is going to come into this fight and be aggressive because Connor is going to continue his fight career so I think in order to make sure that he has 
something to continue to sell his fan base. He needs to have a good showing from this fight, and that's why I believe that he needs to be the aggressor early in this fight. Now, eventually Floyd Mayweather, like he does with every other fighter, is going to figure him out, and then you're going to see Floyd Mayweather be able to counterpunch with precision and mount his assault and ultimately be able to win against Conor McGregor. I'm not saying that Floyd is going to knock him out, although I do think there's the potential for Floyd to knock him down. Uh, but I think ultimately Floyd Mayweather is going to win this fight. I think if he wants to knock him out in the first, he can. I think if he wants, I really do. I think. If so you think to, he can stop it? In I the think first he can do whatever. He wants yeah, to. this is. I mean, he's going up against a guy who has never boxed before. And I, I heard I, I had sports in on earlier today. They're like, let's keep in mind that McGregor has won five MMA fights in stoppages in the first round. Well, that has nothing to do with boxing. <laughs> nothing I mean, to that do with has it at nothing all. Nothing to do. Yes, if he's able to take him by the neck and throw him down. <laughs> if this is an MMA, look, Chris. If this is an MMA fight, Mayweather would get destroyed. Yeah, but it's not. So I have to look for what it is, and what it is, it has to be a clean fight. If you're McGregor, you can't come come out and and fight like an animal. I think you can press the envelope a little bit and go to the the periphery of what is legal and not legal. But you're going to have to fight a somewhat legal fight. And I just I, there is no way that you can convince me a guy that has never fought a boxing match before is going to go out there and and beat this guy. I just I mean he's one of the all time greats. So I just I can't buy into it. No, I don't see it either. I think Brett Alcomogo was was making the point this morning on Mike and Mike that Conor McGregor potentially had an advantage in the clinch if he was able to lean on Floyd Mayweather, maybe stay locked up with him a little bit longer, pull his shoulders down, you know, use his size advantage in that in that instance that maybe he could kind of wear Floyd down. But I just don't see Floyd being worn down when by Conor McGregor. When have you ever We've watched, never seen When it. have you ever watched a fight never with, with Mayweather where the guy backs him into the corner, weighs on him, pushes him around, slogs it into a, a dirty, ugly fight, and you're like, oh, you know what, this is... It, it's always, it is always Mayweather dictating the fight and doing what he wants to do. But wouldn't that be... The type of fight that gives Connor the best chance to get to be successful in this bout wouldn't it have to be that type of fight? Wouldn't he have to make it ugly? Wouldn't he have to make it more of a brawl? But don't rather you think other guys match? have tried to do that? Of course they have. And has anyone even remotely succeeded? Not even close. Guys much more skilled than than the Connor McGregor in boxing have no, tried to right. do that to him. No, you're absolutely right, and that's why I think Floyd Mayweather is going to win this fight on Saturday night. W- would you be disappointed if they walked into the middle of the ring? And and Mayweather just knocked him out in nine seconds. Like, would you would or would you be like th- that was terrific? No, I think everybody would be disappointed. You'd be, I so, would be disappointed. So you want to see a couple of rounds of boxing? I want to see a couple of rounds, and this thing is going to go as long as Floyd Mayweather wants it to go because he's clearly the more skilled fighter in this instance. Like I said, I don't know if it's going to be a knockout or if it's going to go to a decision, but it's going to end the way that Floyd Mayweather wants it to end. He's going to dictate the terms of this fight. Even though I think Conor will come out and try to be the aggressor, I think Floyd Mayweather is going to control this from the opening bell. Well, let's go to Fred in Queens. Fred, you're on the Stephen A. Smith Show with Dave Rothenberg and Chris Canty. Good afternoon, Fred. Good afternoon, guys. Uh, I just, I, I'm sick and tired of all these boxing enthusiasts saying the same thing. I, see, I hear the same thing over and over again. Conor McGregor never boxed. He's in a different arena. Look, a punch is a punch. A body punch is a punch. This guy's the strongest puncher I've ever seen. I'm only 30, but the strongest puncher, the strongest left hand I've ever seen. When this guy drops his left hand on people, they're shocked. They can't believe this guy's power. Now, I'll give it to you. Floyd Mayweather is a defensive fighter, and he might be able to escape a couple of those, but Conor McGregor will lay it on him. Conor McGregor will knock him out within the first three rounds. That's a guarantee. <laughs> okay. All right. Listen, you call back next week, and we'll have this very same discussion. <laughs> and thanks for the phone call, Fred. Because I just don't understand. Yes, he's an enormously strong man. But Mayweather, I think I don't even think it's up for debate, Chris, is the greatest defensive boxer in the history of the sport. It's not even a question, Dave. It's not even a question. So to, to undersell it and say he's a defensive fighter, I mean, come on. Are we being serious? We're not giving Floyd Mayweather the credit where credit is due. And if you want to rationalize it or justify you buying the fight, I understand that. If you're an MMA fan and you believe in Conor or you're a Conor McGregor fan and you just want to see him knock out Floyd Mayweather, then this didn't just say that. But don't, don't, don't critique Floyd Mayweather and say, oh, he's just a defensive fighter when he's the best defensive fighter in the sports history. Right, and how you come on and you're like, well, you, you're not giving 
McGregor, the, the dude that he deserves. Uh, listen, he's never fought in this field before. There is no dude. There's right. no track record with, with Conor McGregor as a boxer. I mean, it's like saying, you know, Michael Jordan was, was an elite, great, phenomenal basketball player. You guys didn't give him the credit he deserved when he played baseball. Well, baseball's different. It's not the same thing. <laughs> and you say, well, it's still fighting. It's a different brand of fighting. That left hand is probably a lot easier to throw when there's a thought that he could, you know, take you down by the leg or knee you in the jaw. All you have to worry about when you're Mayweather now is his hands, and that's it. That's it. Let's go to uh, Mustafa in Vancouver. How do you feel about going to Canada? You feel comfortable with that? I'm good with the Canucks. All right, let's go to Vancouver. Mustafa, you're on the Stephen A. Smith Show. How's it going, fellas? I just want to talk quickly about this fight. We all know what's going to happen, okay? Mayweather's going to win. But when Mayweather wins and Connor loses, I'm not putting this loss on Connor's resume, and I'm not giving Floyd the 50-0 record. Because you know what? You beat a guy who never boxed. He doesn't deserve that kind of 50-0 record. I mean, it's, it's, it's like saying you beat somebody who's never professionally fought before. I'm not giving you that 50-0 record. As far as uh, Connor's conditioning, um, I think when MMA is a lot more things you're doing, you're, you're uh, grabbing each other, you're wrestling, you're pinching. So it's, it takes a lot more on your body, and I you think you can't Connor pinch. Can there's no, there's no pinching. <laughs> no pinching. You tried to sneak pinching by us. There's no pinching. <laughs> Could you imagine that guy's in a clinch and he's he's pinching him? They're wearing gloves. There's no pinching. He's one of the best pinchers in the sport. Yeah, he is. Yeah, thanks to the call, Mustafa. He he is. You know, he, he's known for the chokehold and the special pinching technique that he has created over the course what? of the time. Mustafa brought up a good point, and I don't think enough people are talking about it. You know, the Floyd Mayweather record, forty nine and zero. Uh, of course, being tied with Rocky Marciano, and of course, that family having an issue with identifying this as Floyd's 50th fight, potentially his 50th victory, surpassing the great Rocky Marciano. And and I tend to side with the Mayweather legacy in terms of this being a sanctioned boxing match by the Nevada Boxing Commission. So it's actually going to happen in a boxing ring. It's a boxing match. And I get that Conor McGregor doesn't have a boxing background. He doesn't have any track record as a professional boxer. But he's got a boxing license. So he's going to step in with Floyd Mayweather, and it is ultimately going to be another victory for Floyd Mayweather. Now, Rick DiPietro obviously has some different thoughts on that point. He thinks McGregor's going to win? Or no, he, he doesn't think he this, doesn't think this is going to count as on, a box, on his boxing record. He thinks there should be an asterisk next to this fight in the similar way that we should put an asterisk next to Barry Bonds' home run record. But I'm just going to say this. I mean, it's a boxing fight, and if Floyd Mayweather, when he wins on Saturday night, it'll be his 50th victory, and he will have that 50-0 record surpassing Rocky Marciano. Does it do anything for, for me that he's going to win this fight with his legacy? No. Is it a victory? I mean, it's it's a victory. You have to count it. Yeah. A win is a win. It's, it's a victory, and it'll go on his record as 50, but does it really ultimately make him better legacy terms or anything? No. Absolutely not. All right, we, we, we'll continue this conversation. The quarterback tiers, we want to get into that as well. Bad fans in Boston. Did you? See, I don't know if you saw what they did. It's really disappointed with some of these fans in Boston. It's the Stephen A. Smith Show with Dave Rothenberg and Chris Canty right here on ESPN Radio and the ESPN app. Guess what? You're in the middle of the Stephen A. Smith Show podcast. Damn it, I mean it! Stephen A. Smith Show, Dave Rothenberg, Chris Canty in for Stephen A. Apparently bad weather in Vegas earlier today. Did you hear about that? I did hear about the storm out there. I didn't even know that th sort of How thing existed in Vegas. I thought Vegas was like just nirvana in every single aspect. Yeah, I thought it was too. I guess not. No. I guess it does rain out in Vegas. <laughs> Evidently. Apparently thunderstorm and lightning too. Yeah, they had to push uh, first take back a little okay. bit. Good show. Um, Max Kellerman, of course, and Stephen A. all out in, uh, in Vegas. The fight is... is uh, Saturday night. Saturday what night. What time is that going to start? Like like 12.30 Eastern? Nah, the fight will probably happen, what, around 11, 11.30? No way. Yeah, around 11.30. What would you put the over-under on? I'm going to say 11.30. I bet you could bet on it. Do you think you can bet on what time the fight starts? I mean, it's Vegas. I'm sure you can bet on <laughs> right. anything regarding can you imagine, sports. Imagine walking up being like, I'd like to place a wager. Okay, sir, what would you like to yeah. do? On the start time of the fight. The start, the start time, time of the fight. fight. <laughs> when they're actually going to walk out. So, so you, I, 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 would, I would put it on, and I don't know if there is one or not, uh, 11.45. Okay, so we're off by 15 minutes. All right, 11.45. Okay, 11.45. Yeah, I think, I think that's realistic. Okay. 866 The quarterback list, the tier list, I want to get into that in a little bit. Uh, Rothamer and Cantian for Stephen A., by the way. Um, and we got to get into the Celtics story, which I'm so – look, there's no more passionate, great fan than the Boston fan. On every sport they root for, the Patriots, the Red Sox, 
the Bruins, the Celtics. But what they all did, of which with their sports teams right now are good. They're Celtics all, all, are very all, good. All Patriots are, are out of this world. Bruins are good. Solid, yeah. And the Red Sox are very, very good. Yeah, exactly. And if all you, of them if are you good look, right now. They've had championships. How recently? Celtics yeah, have I mean, won a championship within the last decade. Yeah. Patriots, Patriots won just, just won. Red Sox have won, what, three in the last 15 years? Yeah. And the Bruins have won in the last decade. So they certainly are, I think I think it's fair to say, in some ways, a spoiled fan base. Yeah, so you? if you're a Boston fan, what do you have to complain about? Well, so well, let's get into the story because we start to talk about it a little bit. So how, how about this, by the way? Celtics fan, and I, I thought this was like the onion. I was like, well, this can't be true. We're burning Isaiah Thomas jerseys after he was dealt to the Cleveland Cavaliers. Do they understand that he, first of all, Kevin Durant picks up, leaves, goes from Oklahoma City to Golden State. If you have a problem with that, fine. You're burning the jersey. It's a little bit much for me, but okay. He was dealt. He was traded. He did not say, I need to leave Boston. This was a guy that when his sister died in a car crash said, I'm not missing a game. I will grieve with you people, but I'm not missing a game. And in turn... They burn his jersey when he's dealt? That's that's embarrassing. And it's disrespectful, too. I mean, you're talking about a guy who was the last pick of the draft that worked his way into being a top-five MVP candidate, the focal point of your team last year, which won the Eastern Conference. And the thank you that he gets after being shipped to the Cleveland Cavaliers from the fan base is that you're going to burn his jersey. I mean, it's just disrespectful. It's after awful. all that he's been through this past season, after – all of the great moments that he's bought Boston Celtics basketball fans in that area. Everything that he's done, you decide you're going to burn his jersey over a decision that he had absolutely no control over. That makes no sense so to it, me. It's embarrassing. Here, here's the thing. This should be like, just like a general rule. If, if a guy is traded, you're not allowed to burn the jersey. Like He was dealt. Danny Ainge said, we like you, but we want to get better and trade you. And, and people are nuts enough to burn the jersey. If you're dealt... Burning the jersey should not be allowed. It shouldn't be in the cards, absolutely. I mean, I'm against it anyway, even if a player decides that they're going to leave in free agency. I understand more outrage in the sense that the player leaves the team, but it wasn't Isaiah Thomas's choice. Danny Ainge and the Boston Celtics made the decision that they weren't going to acquiesce to his de- contract demands of a max contract extension. They weren't going to pay him that money. So rather than do that, we're going to trade him to Cleveland and get somebody that we feel can be more of a focal point for what we're trying to build toward, which is being able to take advantage of this championship window that we now have opening up with the team that we're assembled with the roster that we have. Did, so I mean, it just makes no sense. It, it's it's embarrassing for, for the Celtics fans and for Boston fans. And, and uh, I'm sure there are Celtics fans who, who hear about this and see it and like, oh, this is not us. But it's some and some is, is too much. You ever have your uh, jersey burnt? I don't think so. But it wouldn't surprise like when me you if there Dallas? weren't a few jerseys with the Dallas Cowboys, a couple of 99 jerseys that were. I feel good about that, though. Yeah, I mean, I did come to the Giants and win a Super Bowl championship for your team. Yes, yes, yeah, I did. So if you can't beat them, join them. There you go. Yeah, that a, that a boy. Eight six six seven two nine three seven seven six. So R J Bell, who breaks down all odds Vegas wise, will join us in about six minutes right here on the Stephen A. Smith Show. Let's quickly go to Bear in Indiana. Bear, you're on the Stephen A. Smith Show with Rothenberg and Canty. What's up, buddy? Hey, how you doing? Good. Uh, with the uh... Uh, Isaiah Thomas, I don't, I don't put it past him. Remember uh, when uh, Nate Robinson uh, was with the Bulls, and uh, they just traded him after he had a, a stellar playoffs picture when uh, Der- Derrick Rose went down. So some some form fashion people don't like the uh, short uh, point guards. Wait, what wait, wait. What you good? think that they're burning jerseys because they don't like guys that are under six feet tall? Really? Well, no, yeah, but you, the organization, they really don't have a true value for a uh, shorter uh, point guard. They don't see the true value in them. Well, I, I think that that's ever, fair. I, I, think, I think that that makes sense. Look, I've said it thanks to the call, Bear. Kenny, I've said I don't think you can win a, a championship with Isaiah Thomas as your best player. No, you're probably right because the size size matters for something, especially at the position defensively. He's a liability, and he's knocking on 30. And when you consider that no player under six feet has made an all-star appearance – over the age of 30, I think the organization made a decision that his skill set and with the concern with the labrum in his hip and that injury that he's coming off of this offseason, he wasn't necessarily going to be a player that could get them where they need to be in the future in terms of being able to capitalize on the window that's going to open up when LeBron James eventually is on the de- decline or he leaves the Cleveland Cavaliers and they break up the Golden State Warriors. I don't think that they felt like Isaiah Thomas 
was enough in terms of being able to couple him with Gordon Hayward and all the acquisitions they made this offseason to be able to put them over the hump to beat the Cleveland Cavaliers in the Eastern Conference Finals or beat the Golden State Warriors in the NBA Finals. And that's why they went the direction that they went in trading for Kyrie. All right, R.J. Bell is going to join us in about five minutes. We'll come back and we'll talk to him. He's got all the Vegas odds about this fight and the NFL. What time will the fight start? And can you bet the over-under on that? There's odds of McGregor not landing a single punch in the entire fight. (laughs) 90 to 1. How about that? If there's a rematch, would it be by UFC rules? That'd be 100 to 1. Well, you can bet anything in Vegas. You can bet anything in Vegas. And we will talk to R.J. Bell next. Rothenberg and Canty in for Stephen A. right here on ESPN Radio and the ESPN app. Give Stephen A. a piece of your mind. He is sorry. Call him weekdays from 1 to 3 Eastern. I mean, just trash. At 866-729-3776. Guess what? You're in the middle of the Stephen A. Smith Show podcast. Damn it, I mean it! Dave Rothenberg and Chris Canny in for Stephen A. And we head out to the Sin City, Las Vegas, Nevada. Bring in one of the greats, R.J. Bell, founder of Pregame.com, the exclusive odds provider to the Associated Press. Anything going on in uh, Vegas this weekend at all, R.J.? You know, I was thinking about some Netflix, maybe uh-huh. Oz- Ozarks, I hear, is pretty good. Yeah, I think that's that's probably the way to go. Uh, so can you, because we were talking about this, what time do you think this fight's going to start? Can you bet on the start time over under of this fight? You know, I act not in Vegas for sure, but with the online books, you can bet on anything, right? Because there's no regulation, and if people are interested, they're going to put odds on it. Sometimes with some stuff that is maybe even unco- that kind of uh, rated R kind of things, like when someone passes away and all kind of stuff like that. Vegas does a good job, though, of not venturing into that because – Quite frankly, for most people, it's distasteful. But all joking aside about Vegas this weekend, I'll tell you guys, 19 years I've lived here in Las Vegas, and I grew up in a small town in Ohio with 4,000 people, a coal mine in town. So it was a real contrast. There is nothing like a prize fight night. And I don't mean just a regular pay-per-view, but Mayweather, Pacquiao maybe was the last time. The energy level in Vegas unmatched. Super Bowl doesn't compare. March Madness doesn't compare. And one last thing. Think of all the people throughout the country that have a ton of money, but they don't get to live and feel that money. The guy in Texas that owns, let's say, six, seven, elevens. He drives a nice car. He's got a nice house, but he doesn't feel his money as much as he might like. Vegas is expert at giving those guys an experience. They can't get anywhere. And maybe it costs them 40000 bucks for the weekend. They've got the money. These are the kind of weekends Vegas does, like unlike anyone else. RJ, I'm going to get straight to it. I got a question to ask you. They say that there are some sports books out there that have the odds of Conor McGregor not landing a single punch in the entire first round at 5-1. to one. How can that even be possible? Remember now, if you look at the, I think it's CompuBox, but whatever the official counter is of the punches – is I saw those odds and I thought, wow, I had your first reaction, which is isn't that a sign of how dominant Mayweather seems to be in this fight? But here's the other thing. Against Pacquiao, Pacquiao in the first round against Mayweather landed two punches. So maybe it's because they're going to be nervous like the first – 10 minutes of the Super Bowl, you know how teams are super conservative. These two are going to be pretty nervous, I think. So, yeah, it's certainly a long shot that he doesn't land McGregor even one punch. But when Pacquiao only landed two in the first round, it's not that much of a long shot. RJ, the odds open at 25 to 1. 10 days ago, they were 6 to 1. Now they're 4 to 1. Is there just huge amounts of money coming in on McGregor for this one? Yeah, so let's think for a minute, Dave, about what that means. Twenty. You had to bet 20. $25 to win a dollar, 100 to win $4. That's a huge favor. And it's been McGregor, 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 over 90% of the individual bets, each ticket. Doesn't matter if it's 10 bucks or 10,000, each ticket, about 90% of the tickets on McGregor. Why? Because the public loves a big payoff. Think about the lottery, right? The ultimately big payoff. And 
if you walk up to the window and you say, hey, I want to bet 20 bucks, and they tell you, okay, Mayweather 20 wins you five. It's like, oh, that doesn't sound good. But with McGregor, hey, 20 wins you 60 or 80, hmm, that sounds like more fun. So that's part of the phenomenon. But there's one other thing. I've never heard this before, and this is one-of-a-kind stuff. Any individual betting event, Vegas usually is going to shrug if they win or lose because there's so many events in a day, a week, a month, etc. The betting on this is so big, and some are estimating this fight's going to have more betting in Nevada than the Super Bowl did this year. That's amazing that when they are so lopsided on one side, they start to get scared because my estimate is if McGregor wins this fight, that Vegas could lose – 10 plus million dollars as a city they do not vegas hates to lose so the mandate has actually come down from the vice presidents from the bosses upstairs to say you've got to even this action out so in a way part of this latest drop where the mayweather odds have gone down hasn't been about money coming in on mcgregor it's been about the lopsidedness of the batting so far they're trying to attract mayweather money almost like there's a car car for for sale the new ones are coming in next month you've got to lower the price in order to get people to buy those cars right now there's a sale on mayweather because they want more mayweather money rj with the with the action being so one-sided with the mcgregor mayweather fight in comparison to the super fight that we have coming up in a couple weeks with triple g canelo alvarez how do those two fights match up in terms of the money coming in in vegas Great question because, man, oh, man, if anyone wants to talk about the spectacle and I'll be honest, here in town, guys, like any town, you've got the radio guys here on ESPN. I had a show on our local station here for four years. I know them very well. Is they lament, oh, this isn't a real fight. This is more of an exhibition, blah, blah, blah. All right, here, here you go. The amount of money bet on this fight is estimated to be 20 times the amount bet on triple triple g against alvarez so i'm not saying as of now i'm saying projected to be the finished handle 20 times as much so yeah you've got the aficionados and i'm going to certainly want to see that triple g fight that are interested in that fight but man oh man the interest level in this fight at least from a betting perspective with mayweather 20 times as much all right well enjoy the weekend we'll talk to you real soon two weeks from today the nfl season starts it's a good time to be at in Vegas. R.J. Bell, always a pleasure, my friend. Thank you. You're very, very welcome. That's R.J. Bell, pregame.com. How about that? 20, 20 times more on this fight than on, on what should really be a much better fight. Wow, the action on this fight is going to eclipse the Super Bowl. It's unbelievable. It really is. Speaking of the Super Bowl, what a segue, Chris Canny. Super Bowl odds that R.J. Bell sent us. We'll get to that in just a moment. And the quarterback tiers as well. Rothering and Canny in for Stephen A. right here on ESPN Radio and the ESPN app. That's just a sample of what you'll hear on the Stephen A. Smith Show. Weekdays at 1 p.m. Eastern on Sirius XM Channel 80 and the ESPN app. It's all pro, tight end, Rob Gronkowski. And nothing fuels my patented Gronk Spike like all natural Alberto beef jerky. Lean beef, slow cooked, and seasoned to perfection. It's all natural and all delicious. Don't take a chance with some wimpy snack. Go with protein packed, all natural Alberto beef jerky. Alberto beef jerky. You get out what you put in. Refer to Alberto's all natural line of beef jerky. Minimally processed, no artificial ingredients. <laughs> This this is the Stephen A. Smith Show Podcast. I'm Stephen A. Yes, it is the Stephen A. Smith Show. I'm Dave Rothenberg. He's Chris Canty. You say we want to hear from Stephen A., right, Canty? Absolutely. Yeah, well, that's a good thing. Stephen A. Smith Show. It is his show, and he is here and live from Las Vegas. We welcome in Stephen A. Stephen A., there was uh, some torrential storms out there in Vegas this morning, I understand. It was some dreadful, dreadful storms. It was lightning, so first take got delayed. Uh, by nearly two hours, and as a result, we had to come on late, which means we had to stay on late, and that's why I'm not on the air now. But I always know you got me covered, Dave, and I appreciate it, but you gave me an extra treat for my man Canty hanging in there with you. You already know, Stephen A., we're the type of crew that does better without a plan B, so we got you. (laughs) (laughs) What's 
going on, fellas? Not much. Uh, obviously, the fight is now kind of front and center. We're a little more than 48 hours away from the start of this thing. What's the feel in Vegas? You know, Vegas, as we just talked to your buddy R.J. Bell, for big moments, for big events, is really second to none. But this fight may be second to none as far as the juice and the buzz surrounding it. What's the feel in Vegas right now? Well, the feel in Vegas, to me, just from my own personal experience, is being here. You walk around, and what you're seeing is a whole bunch of UFC folks and folks that love the UFC invading the city to the point where they're trying to give the impression they firmly believe Conor McGregor has a chance. And you know Conor McGregor believes that he has a chance. And they don't just lean on the punching power that he packs in either, in either hand. They also think about the lack of power Floyd has in either hand. So the mentality is, is that Connor is definitely going to be outboxed and may very well end up getting humiliated. But at some point in time, he's going to be able to walk Floyd down, to stalk him, and ultimately catch him and pull off one of the greatest upsets we've ever seen. That's the mentality by some, not by all. And Stephen A., I want to stay right there to all of those fans that believe that Conor McGregor and the power that he has in that left hand because Conor McGregor has a reach advantage, because Conor McGregor is the bigger fighter, that he has a good chance of upsetting Floyd Mayweather. What say you to all of that? Well, I agree with them in terms of I'll give him a 1% chance because to me that's his only chance. I expect Floyd to school him, to humiliate him, to annihilate him as a boxer. But that doesn't mean that you're going to take him out. And as long as he's standing up and he's able to withstand and take the punishment that you dole out, you also got to remember that he still has the power. I don't think that he'll knock Floyd out. I don't think that he'll win. I think that he'll get destroyed. But it's only because I don't think he will touch Floyd because Floyd is the most brilliant defensive fighter I've ever seen. That's why I think that Connor is going to get smoked. It's not because I think he's going to get overwhelmed by the power of Floyd. It's the brilliance and the boxing magician that Floyd is combined with his defensive wizardry. And I also think conditioning will kick in because even though you're fighting three rounds instead of five like you do in the UFC, in the UFC you go five five five-round fights. In boxing you go three, you go 12 three-round fights. But that's 11 extra minutes. And I don't think we can minimize the kind of effect that could have on a Conor McGregor, particularly since he's going to be in the ring with one of the best to ever do this. Stephen, I, does does Mayweather need to destroy him? Like, if he goes out and beats him the way he beat Pacquiao, are we going to all be incredibly disappointed where there's another boring Mayweather fight where, yeah, he won, and yeah, he dominated, but we got nothing from it? Like, does he need to go out and at a minimum kind of really beat up uh, Conor McGregor? I, I, I would say so, but here's the problem. And nobody's considered this. And I want to preface my comments by, by explaining. I am not accusing anybody of engaging in any kind of faulty activity or throwing a fight or anything like that. But so much has been made about the money that Floyd and Connor stand to make. Floyd's going to make at least $200 million. Connor's expected to make close to $100 million for this one fight. The other side to all of this is the money that's there for a rematch. If you have a competitive fight and it's not a slaughter, then the appetite for a rematch would be there. And if that happened, you understand, that benefits both fighters as well. So who's to say that Floyd gets in the ring and, dare I say, isn't tempted to make it a bit more interesting than it actually should be just because his nickname is Money Weather. He's unapologetically about the money, and there's more money to be made in a rematch than even you're making in this fight. Stephen A., there have been some grumblings about the family of Rocky Marciano not recognizing this as an actual boxing fight in terms of Floyd Mayweather surpassing Rocky Marciano's 49-0 with his potential victory on Saturday night against Conor McGregor. Conor doesn't have a boxing background. What do you say to that, and do you recognize this as Floyd's 50th fight and 50th victory if and when he defeats Conor McGregor on Saturday? I respectfully agree with Rocky Marciano Jr., and I'm in the minority because I know people like my man Max Kellerman and others are saying it's being sanctioned by the Nevada State Athletic Commission. This is a fight. There are previous champions in boxing history that have fought individuals that had minimal to no experience, and those fights counted. My issue is is never, ever, ever has fought. Conor McGregor has never fought 
professionally as a boxer and therefore should never have been given the right to bypass contenders and go straight to fighting the champion that is Floyd Money Mayweather. I think that you have to pay your dues to some degree in any respect of sport. And the fact that that did not take place here, I, I have no problem with it being an exhibition. But I will have a serious problem if this is counted towards Floyd's 50-0 and record, because I certainly never will count it as that. Stephen A. on his own show here on ESPN Radio, ESPN app. Rothenberg and Canty in for Stephen A. He's out in Las Vegas where a little something is going on this weekend. Stephen A., does does McGregor have to be really physical, like get in there and bang and try to shorten the ring and, and, and throw an elbow, like like make this as dirty as he can with still making it on the clean side of things? I believe he does. I believe that's his only shot. Uh, if you don't do that, you'll get destroyed if you're Conor McGregor. You can't sit out on the outside and just think that you get to box Floyd Mayweather. I don't believe that. Not for one second. You have to go in. You have to be in constant attack mode. You have to suffocate him. You have to cut off the ring, and you have to do everything that you can to turn it into a flat-out brawl. I think if you don't do that, I find it very, very difficult to believe that you're going to have any kind of chance if you're Conor, McG- if you're Conor McGregor. But you also have to remember it's also advantageous for him in this regard. He's got a huge head. You know, he's fought in the UFC, head butts and things of that nature that have stymied Floyd Money Mayweather in the past. It's something that works to the advantage of a Conor McGregor, who's accustomed to getting elbows and kicks and wrestling and having his face, you know, you know, you know, raked against the cage and all of this other stuff. Floyd and boxers don't have to worry about that kind of stuff. Conor McGregor lives that life, so that kind of tussle works to his advantage. That and that's why you got to do everything you can to avoid that kind of a matchup. Stephen A., we know there's mutual admiration between Conor McGregor and Floyd Mayweather. Conor wants to model his career path after Floyd Mayweather in terms of being able to transition from just being a fighter to being involved with the promotions of events. Is there any potential for Conor McGregor to leverage the payday that he's getting now with this fight into future ownership stake with the UFC and Dana White? I don't know about that. Um, it, it doesn't seem it doesn't seem like that would be the case. IMG WME uh, purchased the UFC for four billion dollars. Dana White uh, is the president of the UFC. I don't recall at any time uh, them bringing Conor McGregor's name into the equation for doing anything other than being a fighter. Keep in mind, just a couple of fights ago, about three fights ago, Conor McGregor tapped out against Nate Diaz. You know, when you, you he can talk all he wants to, and he's a very valuable commodity to the UFC. But he, if John Bones Jones hadn't tested positive recently uh, for PEDs, uh, excuse me, would we even be calling Conor McGregor the biggest draw in the sport? A legitimate argument could have been made that that would have been John Bones Jones. More than a year or two ago, Conor McGregor wasn't that. You know who the biggest draw in the sport was? A woman by the name of Ronda Rousey. So let's pump the brakes a little bit in thinking that Conor McGregor is so valuable that he can parlay this into ownership stake. If that's the case, LeBron James can own a piece of the Cavaliers. Michael Jordan would have got a piece of the Bulls. Magic Johnson, even though he ultimately got ownership, a piece of ownership from the, from the uh, Los Angeles Lakers, the same would have, that could have applied to Kobe Bryant. That hasn't happened. I think we need to pump the brakes on that. Conor McGregor is great. We love watching him. But he ain't on that level. All right, Stephen A., enjoy Vegas and uh, enjoy the fight, and we'll certainly talk to you soon, my friend. Thanks a lot, guys. I appreciate it. You're very, very welcome. That, of course, is uh, Stephen A. Smith here on ESPN Radio and the ESPN app, 866-729-3776. So R.J. Bell, let people behind the curtain, Chris. R.J. Bell sends us a, a huge note with all information and stats and gambling nuggets and things that I think are very interesting. Mm-hmm. There is something on this note which I saw which – shocked me and then you said dave did you see this did you see this right it shocked yeah. you as well we will tell you what it is when you hear this you'll be like i cannot believe it it's about the nfl and we'll share it with you next rothenberg and canty in for Stephen a right here on espn radio and the espn app catch the Stephen a smith show live on 98.7 espn new york espn la 710 and sirius xm channel 80 you just can't make this stuff up weekdays from 1 to 3 eastern Okay, keep your eyes closed. Okay. I want to show you my first ever painting. Mm, All right. Okay. Open your eyes. Oh, 
That's a lot of colors、mm-hmm. <laughs> and shapes. So be honest. What do you think? Well,、uh, I like how if you switch to Geico, you could save hundreds of dollars on car insurance. Oh yeah, that's that's true. Yeah. Here, why don't I hold your paintbrush while you call them? Geico, because saving fifteen percent or more on car insurance is always a great answer. You're listening to the Stephen A. Smith Show podcast. Well, Dave Rothenberg and Chris Canny in for Stephen A. on a Thursday. You know what two weeks from tonight is? What do we have? Oh, come on! What do we have? You're Mr. NFL. You're counting down the minutes of the Jaguars game tonight. Course, you don't know what two weeks from kick off to the regular season, yeah, right? Two、we've、weeks from the, tonight, we've got the champs going up against the Kansas City Chiefs. Chiefs and champs. There、yes. we go. I don't like calling the Patriots the champs. I mean, they are the champs. Yeah, I guess they are. So, I mean, doesn't it make my Super Bowl ring shine a little bit brighter, though, knowing that I was a part of the only organization to beat Tom Brady and Bill Belichick in a Super Bowl? You don't need to sell me. Oh, I'm just telling you. you I mean, you don't need to like sell me. I mean, it, just make, it should make you feel better、I、as a Giants fan. I feel great、okay. about the whole、okay. thing through. So, R.J. Bell sent us the odds. Now, don't don't say the news yet. Okay, I want I want to tease this for a、okay. couple minutes. The odds of the, winning the Super Bowl this season. The Patriots are more than double favored to the next team. The Patriots are four to one. Next up is the Seahawks at ten to one. The Packers at twelve to one. The Falcons and Steelers at fourteen to one. The Cowboys and Raiders at eighteen to one. So that's it. You got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven teams at less than twenty to one. Patriots, Chris, are the prohibitive, prohibitive favorite to win the whole thing. No, absolutely. And when you look at what they've done this off season, making the trade to bring in Brandon Cooks, another weapon for Tom Brady to go along with Chris Hogan, Danny Amendola. You got Dwayne Allen. They made that trade. A healthy Rob Gronkowski coming back. I mean, they're loaded on the offensive side of the ball. They addressed the running back position as if they needed to. They already had James White. They already had Deion Lewis. But they went out and they got Mike Gillisley from the Buffalo Bills. And of course, they went out and got Rex Burhead and free agency. So you just feel good about what the Patriots are doing. They're loading up to make another. Run to try to go back to back this season, and quite frankly, I don't know with this offensive firepower and with the changes they made on the defensive side, I don't know that there's anybody that can stop them. You know what the most impressive thing to me is, and you won a Super Bowl, so you you know what it's like to try and come back and and repeat. That is probably the hardest thing to do in any sport is football winning because it's a long season, it's a wearing season, and you have to come back and you have to try to do it again. There is no club that I've ever seen win. And be focused on the next year to try and win again better than New England. Well, because Bill Belichick creates this environment, this culture of competitiveness, and there's no complacency because you're concerned with job security. Bill Belichick will part ways with the best of his players over the course of the years, absent Tom Brady, because he's always going to get rid of a player a year early rather than a year too late. And so I think when you have that type of environment, you have that type of culture. You create a competitively sharp football team, and I think that's what you're going to continue to see with the New England Patriots. The Super Bowl hangover—that's real. I mean, everybody's telling you how good、But、you are as、them. a team. It's not real for the Patriots.、Right. It's real for everybody else except for the New England Patriots, and you have to attribute that to Bill Belichick. Yeah, that's a testament to the coaching and the genius of Bill Belichick. Now, on the flip side of that, we talk about the Patriots being four to one. The Niners bring up the rear; they're number thirty-two at four hundred thirty-seven to one, followed by the Jets. Who are four hundred to one? Browns considerably better than the Jets. You know, we always look at the Browns as kind of like the laughing stock team in the、uh, NFL. The Browns are three hundred to one. Rams two fifty. Bills, who have almost said they want to have a, a rough season and go after a quarterback, they're two fifty. Bears with their multifaceted quarterbacks two hundred. Jaguars one hundred to one. Dolphins eighty three. Redskins eighty two. Ravens, Lions, Colts all seventy five to one. But here's the stat that I saw, which. Shocked me, and you saw it, and it was a little unsettling for me because, like a schoolgirl, you started giggling, and I I didn't feel comfortable with six nine three hundred pound man giggling next to me <laughs> like you were. But I'm going to tell everybody what made you giggle. How about this from R.J. Bell? If Tom Brady went down now, injured, couldn't play, Chris, do you know who the favorite to win the Super Bowl would be? It'd still be the New England. It、Patriots. would still be the New England. Patriots. Think about this for a second. If you took Russell Wilson off of Seattle, would they have any chance to win? No, none. You know, to be honest with you, I don't know who their backup quarterback is. Trevon Boykin, the kid from TCU. Yes. Okay.、Um, Packers twelve to one. If you took Aaron Rodgers off of that team and Brett Hundley gets, <laughs> can they win? No. Matt Ryan, they're fourteen to one. Could they? Like these teams have no chance to do anything if their quarterback were to leave. 
if Brady, this just shows you how amazingly well built this organization is. If Brady were to be done for the season tomorrow, they are still the favorites to win the Super Bowl. Doesn't that just show you how amazing this franchise, this organization is? It really does, and it speaks to the genius of Bill Belichick and, and how he develops his players. I mean, you look at last year when they started the season, the first four games without Tom Brady due to the deflate gate suspension. I mean, they went 3-1 and one over that span, and the only reason that they lost to the Buffalo Bills is because then rookie quarterback Jacoby Brissett had the torn ligament in his thumb, and he couldn't throw the ball. Right. They threw the ball three times in the first half. They couldn't throw the ball, so that's the only reason that they couldn't win because they were a one-dimensional offense and they didn't have the threat to throw the ball. But that just speaks to Bill Belichick and him being able to game plan and tailor plans specifically to accentuate the strengths of whoever's playing the quarterback position. And, of course, it's been Tom Brady over the years, but whether it's Jimmy Garoppolo or Jacoby Brissett, you feel like Bill Belichick is going to put that player in a position where they're going to be effective and operate the offense. Do you think this is a playoff team if Jacoby Brissett is the 16-game regular season starter? I'm not going to bet against it. Dave, it's Bill Belichick and the New England Patriots. I'm not going to bet against it. And, of course, when you start talking about the talent that they have on both sides of the ball, and people forget this. Last year, the New England Patriots had the number one scoring defense in the National Football League. So they're pretty good on that side of the ball, too. When you consider that, yeah, if Tom Brady would have missed the season and Jacoby Brissett were the guy, yeah, I'm not going to bet against them being out of the playoffs, especially with an e- a weak AFC East. That's the easiest division of football, right? It has to be. It has to I be. I mean, you look at the other three Who teams. Who scares you? Well, Who scares you? Wouldn't you say that that is the one division that is is more clear-cut than any division? Like, NFC East, I, I, maybe every team can't win it, but I almost think every team could almost win it. Like, I I don't expect Washington to win it, but I wouldn't be surprised if they went 10-6 and six and won the division. Philadelphia, they could. Giants-Cowboys certainly can. You know, NFC North, that may be the other one, because I think the Packers are clearly the best team there, because the Bears stink, right? Yeah. And the Vikings, eh. The Lions were a playoff team. Yeah, but I, 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 for me at least, I would be surprised if it wasn't the Packers. But that division is, I mean, it's it's have, and it's three teams that have not. Let me ask you this question. Yeah. Is, are the Patriots' backup quarterbacks better than the starting quarterbacks for the other teams in the AFC East? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, to, would you, well, you tell me, would you would you rather have Jimmy Garoppolo or the stuff the Jets have? Oh, of course, Jimmy. Garoppolo. I mean, it's not even close. It's not even close. Would you rather have Would you rather have Tannehill and Cutler, or would you rather have Garoppolo? I'm going to roll the dice with Garoppolo. And Tyrod Taylor is a guy that they look. They have Tyrod Taylor, and they've stripped it down to the point they're that, not sold on Tyrod Taylor. Right, they in want to be bad to to have a top three pick, or they have so much ammunition to grab a top three pick that they're going to be in the market for a quarterback as well. Yeah, you have to say that the Patriots have clearly the best quarterback situation, even if you take Tom Brady away from that team. So they have the best quarterback in the division. And I think you can argue that I still think Aaron Rodgers is better, but you could argue they have the best quarterback in the world. Yes. And then they have the, the greatest s- quarterback of all time. And then they have the second best quarterback in the division. Yes. They don't have the third best quarterback in the division. Nah, do they? you can't be disrespectful. I'm not going to put Jacoby Brissett up there. He's only played in two games. Would you rather have Jacoby Brissett or what the Jets have? Jacoby Brissett. You would. <laughs> I would. I would. I would. You don't buy into this Jets I know trio what Josh, at all. I, I know what Josh McCown is, 15-year journeyman. I understand what he is. He's limited in some aspects. Christian Hackenberg, I'm scared. He looked like a deer in the headlights against the Detroit Lions last Saturday. And, of course, Bryce Petty, I'm just impressed that he's still alive after the beating that he took at the end of last season. But I don't have confidence, as much confidence in any of those guys as I would in Jacoby Brissett because I've actually seen him go out there and win a game in a competitive situation. Yeah, this could be a three and a half over under the Jets' uh, win total this year. It's the eighth toughest schedule in the National Football League. Mm-hmm. I, I just don't know about the institutional control of tie balls, so I'm going to go, and as much as it hurts me to say this, under. I don't want to be disrespectful to tie balls because I really like him. Be I don't put I don't put this year on tie balls. I mean, this team is not necessarily set up for success. They don't have a great deal of experience, but I'm going to go with under. And I think that a lot of Jets fans out there will be glad to see their team win less than three and a half. I'll tell you what, um, not as a player, not as Sheldon Richardson or Muhammad Wilkerson, but I think as a fan of a team, you'd rather go two and 14 than five and 11, no? Yeah. As a fan of a team? I mean, two and 14 pretty much guarantees you an opportunity to grab one of those franchise quarterbacks at the top of next year's quarterback draft class. The 2018 class, I mean, Sam Sam Donald, Josh Rosen, uh, I mean, those guys, the kid from Wyoming, Josh Allen. Do you like one you better than those. the other? 
I like the Allen kid from Wyoming. He's got I mean, big he's arm. Just, he's got a big arm. He looks the part. He's 6'5", 235 pounds. He kind of reminds I mean, me of Roethlisberger. If you're casting a role for a franchise quarterback right. in a movie, that's what it looks like. So I, I trust my eyes in that concern. He can make some throws. Gets in a little bit of trouble, but... You know, I like him. I all like right. the upside. Speaking of, uh, well, well, one more question for you. Does it worry you at all that he didn't go to a big school, that he's going to come out of Wyoming? Well, Carson or? Wentz didn't go to a big school. Sure. And I think that people would point to the potential and feel pretty good about the quarterback situation in Philadelphia yeah, Dante right now. Dante Culpepper didn't go to a big school. No. I mean, a lot of guys didn't go to big schools yeah. that are successful NFL quarterbacks. Derek Carr didn't go to a big school. No. A lot of guys. Guess what? You're in the middle of the Stephen A. Smith Show podcast. Damn it, I mean it! It is the Stephen A. Smith Show. Stephen A. will be back tomorrow. Dave Rothmer, Chris Canny in his stead. Now, Chris, we spent a lot of time on the fight. Talk to Stephen A. Talk to R.J. Bell. Fight is, of course, Saturday night. We're figuring it'll start about 11.45. Are you buying the fight? I'm, I'm undetermined right now. You have to watch the fight. You know, I, I made myself a promise after the Pacquiao-Mayweather fight that I would <laughs> never pay a penny to watch Mayweather again. So, of course, it would only be right that you break that promise for another Floyd Mayweather fight against Conor McGregor. I'm not diametrically opposed to spending some money on a fight, but $100 on this guy that I made myself promise I'll never spend money on again? But I think there's this is such a big event. Exactly. Maybe I will. And you're going to be on air the next day. I am going to be on air the next day, which you would think it would make it prudent to watch the fight. It Can I write sounds it off? like it. Can I write it off? <laughs> it should be a write off. I should, it's I mean, a business if, expense. If I have to watch the fight for work purposes, yeah, can I write it be off? Able to talk about it? Yeah. Yeah. Or I just open up the phone line. So you tell me about the fight. <laughs> so do you think I can follow the fight closely enough on Twitter that I don't need to watch it? and we'll still be able to talk reasonably decent about it. No, because you're going to start trying to track it on Twitter what everybody's saying about it. And then you're going to want to see it. So no. So should I do it? You should do it. I should do it. I'm on board for you buying the fight. All right. Well, I will uh, take that into uh, consideration upon uh, attempting to buy said fight. 866-ESPN, 866-729-3776. So Mike Sandoni does this every year. ESPN senior writer does a great job. Uh, the fourth annual NFL quarterback tier rankings. So let me tell you how they determine it. Featuring an expert panel. Um, this was the largest one yet. 50 league insiders placed 36 quarterbacks into one of five tiers. Tier one reserved for the best of the best. Tier five for the worst. Aaron Rodgers, Tom Brady were the unanimous tier one selections and the only unanimous ones. Okay. All right. But they had new guys coming into their top grouping. Colin Kaepernick, even though he's unsigned, came ahead of eight potential starters. There's a there's a completely different conversation to have. Yeah. The Kaepernick, and there was obviously the demonstration yesterday in front of NFL headquarters, mm -hmm. comes ahead of eight quarterbacks on the list of 36. Well, clearly he's qualified to have a job. He just needs an opportunity. Right. Yeah. Um, so here we go. Here, Here's the list. Uh, Tom Brady, Aaron Rodgers, unanimous. Okay. Still in the first tier, Roethlisberger, Drew Brees, Matt Ryan. That's, okay, let's stop right there. Okay. Matt Ryan. Yeah. I understand that Matt Ryan was the MVP, and of course they had, you know, they got off to fast starts in their game, scoring touchdown drives on every possession in the regular season, their open possession. I get that. I get that Matt Ryan led his team to the Super Bowl. Mm -hmm. Of course, got Julio Jones. It doesn't hurt to have that guy to throw the, uh, throw the ball to. And, of course, you got Devonta Freeman in the backfield. A whole supporting cast, a whole host of characters that contribute to that offense being as explosive. But if we rewind it to the start of last year's regular season, I think you could make a strong argument that Matt Ryan wasn't the best quarter wasn't wasn't that he wasn't the best quarterback in his division. You can make the argument that he was the worst quarterback in his division. Going into the season. Going into last season. But look at what he did last year. No, I understand that. I understand so that. So are you saying that one year is not enough for you to vault the guy into the top tier of NFL quarterbacks? Not when we start considering what's elite versus what's not elite. Trust me, I, I don't believe that one year in the, 20, the 2016 that Matt Ryan had, I don't think he belongs in the tier one of quarterbacks. I'm not going to disagree be, with you. I would be more apt to put Eli Manning in tier one oh, of you're quarterbacks. Gonna people, you're going to have to drive off the road. Because, because he's got two Super Bowl championships. I mean, Matt Ryan, he led his team to a Super Bowl, but he doesn't have any hardware. He hadn't accomplished anything. But it's not like Matt Ryan's year last season was the first time that you looked at him and said, boy, this is a big-time quarterback. We've seen him play really, really well in the past. We've seen him play really, really well in spots. But again, Dave, you could have made the argument before last season that he was the worst quarterback in his division. So it's Cam Newton, Drew Brees, and Jameis Winston. And Jameis Winston. 
Yeah, certainly third at least. Yeah, or at least third. Okay. Right. So the bottom tier of his division. Yeah, I, I guess you could. But last year he was he was elite. He was elite. So and how much time historic, do you, is an historically How much good time offense. do you need to see for a guy to be at that level before you're willing to say, okay, I'll put him in tier one? If he did this again this year, if he led a team to a 12 and four record, if he had 65 percent completion percentage, if he threw for 4,400 yards, if he had another terrific season, and we were having this discussion next year, I say Matt Ryan is is fifth. Are you saying, well, Dave, I don't know that you could put him fifth, or do you say, okay, tier one, he belongs there? If he followed that performance up from last year with another solid performance this year when he's in the MVP conversation again, then yes, I would probably say he's a Tier 1 quarterback. Drew Brees, Roethlisberger, Rodgers, Brady. The only one you have an issue with is Matt Ryan in that Tier 1? The only one I have an issue with is Matt Ryan. You think we're ever going to see signs of age from either Brady or Brees? (laughs) A-ball says doubtful in the near future. It's it's amazing to me. says doubtful in the near future. I, I just don't see it. We've never seen guys... Really, we've never, it's not like kind of we never have. We really, we've never seen guys play at this level at this age, and now we have two of them? We've got two of them. Yeah. It's an unbe- it's unbelievable. Tom Brady, I mean, 40 years old, and nobody's going to bet against him. I think the over-under for the Patriots this year is 12 and a half. I dare somebody to take the under. You couldn't. You couldn't. 12 and a half. I mean, you don't see that as a 13-win t- t- uh, team? At least. At least. At least. At least. But although I will tell you this, you hear a lot of people say they're going to go undefeated. That's ridiculous. You're one of those people. I see your face. You're going to tell me they're going to go undefeated, nineteen and zero. I'm not going to say. I'm not going to say it's 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 outside of the box day because listen, Tom Brady and Bill Belichick, those are the two people that you would say would probably be out to prove the point that they're capable of doing it, especially after the spy game era. Do you understand era. how difficult that is? Listen, I Proving understand. the point is one thing. I Winning underst- 19 games without losing? Well, listen, I understand it, Dave, but they haven't gone back-to-back with Super Bowl championships since Spygate. And so it wouldn't, it wouldn't <laughs> surprise me to see that this is something that's laying in the back of both of their minds in terms of being able to establish that part of, or eliminate that part of their legacy in terms of what contributed to their success. How great would it be if they went 18-0 and faced the Giants again in the Super Bowl <laughs> and the Giants beat them? Like We, we can't be that fortunate, can we? No, I, I don't know with the offensive line that you're going to be as fortunate to be able to get there if you're the New York Giants. I think you might be right. All right, yep. second tier, Andrew Luck, who, by the way, two two and a half weeks from the start of the season, we don't know that he's going to be able to play in week one. I know, right? You would be reluctant to put him out there if he doesn't play in a dress rehearsal game, um, you know, starting week one. I know he's not going to play in the fourth preseason game. Obviously, well, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't do that. You wouldn't play any of your starters in the fourth preseason game. But if he didn't play in a dress rehearsal game, I don't know that I would throw him out there in week one. So it begs the question of when are we going to see Andrew Luck this season? Because right I, now he's still on physically unable to perform. And I think it's fair to say if they don't have Andrew Luck, they, they have nothing. Like yeah. they, they, they are. Are they, a, are they really going to roll with Scott Tolzien as their starting quarterback week one? What choice do they have if Luck can't play? Right. I mean, so, there, so there is Luck, this free agent quarterback that a lot of people are making noise about. Yeah, I've heard of him. Yeah. Derek Carr, Philip Rivers, who I actually think is underrated. I think Philip Rivers is a terrific quarterback. Matthew Stafford, Russell Wilson. Ten for Russell Wilson seems low to me, and the guy that's always seemingly disrespected, number eleven, the guy that helped you to that Super Bowl ring. One Eli Manning. Yeah. I guess the, they're making a delineation between regular season Eli and playoff Eli. Because pl- clearly playoff Eli should be higher on this list. I, I think, I mean, clearly, play, if you're ranking playoff quarterbacks right now, Brady, Rodgers. Rodgers. He's got hardware. He's got a trophy in a trophy case. Although the first, the first Super Bowl he won, he was awful. Yeah. Um... Eli? You have to consider it. You have to consider it. I mean, ahead of Breeze? Chris, he had two of those those runs. He had two of those runs, and he had had some memorable throws in both Super Bowls. Now, I know the one that David Tyree is memorable for a different reason, but the throw that he made in Super Bowl 46 to Mario Manning on the the sideline on that game-winning drive— I don't know that you can make that throw 100 times and hit it again. I mean, it's unbelievable. It's one of the great throws in the history of football. Yeah. Really. So, I mean, when you start talking about a quarterback that can be at his best when his best is needed, that competitive greatness, it's hard to rank many quarterbacks ahead of number 10 for the New York Giants. Uh, Let me give you the rest of the second tier, Cam Newton and Kirk Cousins. So there are, are 13 quarterbacks in the top two tiers. We'll run through 
the third, fourth, and fifth tier. Get to your calls as well. 866-ESPN, 866-729-3776. Roth, number again, Canty, in for Stephen A. Right here, ESPN Radio, ESPN app. Want to be a part of the show? It's Stephen A. Up weekdays from 1 to 3 Eastern at 866-729-3776. Guess what? You're in the middle of the Stephen A. Smith Show podcast. Damn it, I mean it! Rothenberg, Chris Canyon for Stephen A. ESPN Radio, ESPN app, running through the quarterback tier for Mike Santa. You, you found an interesting stat, Chris Canny. Yeah, so there have been nine 5,000-yard passing seasons. Nine. Of the nine, Drew Brees has five of them. So he has more than half of the 5,000-yard <laughs> seasons in the history of the NFL. It's unbelievable. The one I, I will always remember, because it was so unusual, I guess it was 84 when Marino had 5,048, was it? Yeah, it's 5,084 yards. 5,084, right. 5,084. And they just weren't throwing the ball back then. Right. So to, to have a guy have, have that kind of a season when everyone else is throwing for like 3,000 yards is just unbelievable. So you got five from Brees. Five from Breeze. One from Marino. You got one from Marino. You've got one from Peyton Manning. And the other one that's surprising a little bit, Matt Stafford back in 2011. One from Peyton Manning. Yeah, Matt Stafford. Yeah, that would be the one that I would never remember. Yeah. Because it doesn't feel like Matt doesn't Stafford feel like is Matt at that Stafford level, does it? Stafford belongs in that company, right? No. Doesn't, yeah. doesn't to me, at least. All right, no. so we went through the first two tiers of this quarterback tiered system. Tier three, this is interesting, and, and I don't know how you rank this guy. And Dak Prescott leads off Tier 3. Do you look at Dak Prescott as a guy that should be higher? Is this appropriate for where he should be? How much of it is the offensive line? I mean, they didn't make it very difficult on him last year. He was only picked four times, but but Scott Linehan and that offense made it as, as easy as possible for him to succeed. Where do you fall in line with Prescott? I feel like they should have expanded Tier 2 and included Dak Prescott at the back of Tier 2. And I say that they probably got him in Tier 3 just because he don't have a huge body of work right there. He's only got one season. But in that one season, you know, he's got, he's got 13 wins. And winning has to count for something when you start talking about this game. You look at his performance. He only threw four interceptions last year. And you talk about 23 touchdowns and, of course, 3,667 yards for a team that was a run-first offense. So, I mean, when you talk about the totality of his body of work, as it pertains to impact on winning, I think he did exactly what they needed him to do in order to put themselves in a position where this could be a playoff team. So when people say, yeah, Prescott, he's really good, but he's a product of that system, does that annoy you or do you think that's a fair statement? Well, I mean, they've got a very good offensive line. Right. And their offensive line not only benefits Dak Prescott, but it benefits the defense because their defense is not very good. But it, you don't have to be a very good defense when you're not on the field. And that's what that offensive line does. Because they're able to run the ball, they can play a ball control offense. And I think Dak Prescott is the beneficiary of having a really good offensive line. Because what do they always talk about with young quarterbacks? They wait for the game to slow down. But when you have an offensive line that can block and provide more time, you have more time. Yeah. So, I mean, the game, in effect, does slow down for Dak Prescott, and he took advantage of those opportunities. All right, Tier 2, more from this tier. Uh, Joe Flacco ranks 15th, second in Tier 2. He's a guy that's also hurt. They might have to start Ryan Mallett this season in Baltimore. They don't want to start Ryan Mallett at quarterback They might not have a choice. <laughs> I mean, well, you know, here's the thing. And, and I know Joe Flacco has had some injury concerns over the last couple of seasons. He had the back injury, of course, that's keeping him out of training camp now. He had the ACL a couple of seasons ago, and so... They're a little bit concerned about his health, and they're being wise in terms of holding him out. But Baltimore's got to figure out something because they've had a couple of back-to-back lackluster years, and that's just not acceptable down in Baltimore. I know the ownership down there, Steve Bashotti, expects more from their team. Ozzie Newsom, he expects more from that ball club. And so uh, they've got to figure something out in Baltimore. And, of course, the most important position, the quarterback position, is a big question mark for them right now. You know what's interesting in looking through this list? We, we talk about guys that play until they're older. Brady is number one, certainly an older quarterback. Ro, what, what's Rodgers, 33? So he's not old. Roethlisberger, I, I think it's fair to say, is an older quarterback. Drew Brees, older quarterback. Um, Rivers, older quarterback. Eli, older quarterback. Prescott's young. Flacco's fairly young. Carson Palmer is 16th, older quarterback. So really, kind of what jumps off the page to me is 
it's possible to be a very successful quarterback well into your mid, even late 30s now at this stage. Yeah, I know. And with most positions in the National Football League, you talk about players being on the wrong side of 30. But I guess when you're considering the quarterback position, I mean, they have to get to 40 before you really see teams start to question about how long the guy can continue to play at that level. I mean, even with Tom Brady, he just turned 40. Are you going to bet against Tom Brady having a good season? No. I don't think most people will. No. I mean, even with Drew Brees knocking on 40, are you going to bet against him not having a prolific season as a passer? No. I, I, no. I, I will be late to the party on Brady. Like, Tom, I, you know, we'll come at 42, 43, 44. Dave, what do you think about him? I think he'll be great. Until I see, really, until I see him not be sensational, I just, I'm on the side that Tom Brady's just, he's amazing. Same thing with the Patriots, same thing with the Warriors, same thing with LeBron James. Like, there are just certain things in sports right now that I believe so much in that I won't go the other way until I see it. No, you're absolutely right. And with the way the rules are in terms of being able to protect the quarterback within the pocket, I think that you're starting to see these guys play longer and longer because the league wants to protect these franchise guys, recognizing that you have to have stars to be able to market your game, and it's going to be more entertaining when you have more passing and more scoring. Let's look at the flip side of this. Last of the 36 quarterbacks, Cody Kessler. Then we stay with the Browns. 35th, Brock Osweiler. 34th, Josh McCown. 33rd, Tom Savage. 32nd. Jared Goff. I think Jared Goff's going to be better this year than he he's, was. He's going to be better this year. He has having, to be. having Sean McVay now, a younger offensive coordinator, great offensive mind, I think they'll be better. I think he's poised for a breakout year. Blake Bortles tied for 29th. He's not going to be the starting quarterback in Jacksonville this no, year. No, it looks is like he? Jacksonville is going for a shot of Henny, and they're going to start Chad Henny tonight in their third preseason game. That's usually the dress rehearsal. That's probably going to be their week one guy. And then we'll leave you with this, guys. The 28th quarterback on this list of these tiers, Colin. Kaepernick. Without even analyzing, that's where we are. Chris, good stuff today, buddy. Appreciate you, man. Appreciate right. you, Dave. Holding it down for our guy, Stephen A. Smith. That's right. He'll be back tomorrow, so that's it for us right here on ESPN Radio and, of course, the ESPN. That's just a sample of what you'll hear on the Stephen A. Smith